Hello, everyone, and welcome. Today will be a different sort of webinar, a departure from our regular webinar series. Today, we're going to talk about a recent publication comparing the performance of Mastermind with some other competing databases. And as I'll articulate throughout the conversation that we're going to have today, there were serious issues with both the data, the analysis, as well as the conclusions for that paper. And I'm going to be walking you through those details. So thank you for joining me as we undertake correcting the record and highlighting the crucial role of data integrity in these kinds of comparison studies. A little bit of housekeeping. Links will be provided in the webinar resource section to the original publication uh, letter to the editor that my team and I uh, put together, as well as a response to that letter from the original authors and a corrected version of the original publication. Questions asked throughout in the Q&A tab in the webinar. I'm happy if we have time to address any of those questions. The webinar will be recorded and the contents will be emailed to you uh, for further review. If you have questions on, on uh, additional viewing or if you're not able to join, welcome um, in absentia. By way of introduction, uh, this is also a, a point of departure from our typical webinar series in that I'm the sole presenter. So this is really meant to be less formal and more of a, a conversation here as we walk through some of these uh, data details. But I'm Mark. I'm a physician scientist by training. I am the co-founder and chief science officer of Genomenon. And uh, for those of you who are familiar, you will have heard us say this before because we live and breathe our mission. Uh, we're very mission driven in that we strive to make genomic information actionable to save and improve lives of patients with both rare disease and cancer. And uh, Genomenon, when I originally found and up to this day, not just from me, but from everybody who comprises the Genomenon team, uh, was really founded on the principles that data and evidence matter, and that getting it right is crucial given the acuity of the use of these uh, results that we produce in our software, in our data products, and delivered through our services. So you'll see that come out as a, as a general theme in the, in the conversation that we have over the next hour or so. This is the way we're gonna articulate that conversation. It's, it's fairly straightforward. I've got them sectioned out here. I'm gonna go through a background. I'm gonna talk about Mastermind, but obviously not be very feature focused, but, but rather higher level about what Mastermind is and does and how to look at it, how to use it. I'm gonna walk through the details of the original publication. I'm gonna go through, um, at a detailed enough level, some of the analysis that was performed by my team and I when we first saw that original publication that resulted in the ultimate um, letter response and corrected version. And then I'm going to wrap up with some commentary and some conclusions sort of as a corollary to all the things that we've talked about, a way to put all of this into perspective. So let's begin with a discussion of the background. As I said, this is about Mastermind, but it's at a, at a higher plane. Mastermind is a genomic intelligence platform. And there are three things about Mastermind that I really want to highlight that I think are really germane to the topic that we're going to be discussing today. The first is the genomic evidence that's in our mission statement. It's the, the center of what we do. There's multiple steps after aggregating this evidence, but you have to start with a complete data set. And our complete data set, as it is stemming from the scientific and medical literature in peer-reviewed publications, comprises nearly 10 million full text articles and 3 million supplemental data sets prioritized for having relevant um, genomic and genetic content, content about disease, content that can influence uh, diagnoses for patients. So building from there, as I'll, as I'll discuss, we, we have to extract the information from that content. And there's a vastness to this content that necessitates a computational approach to being maximally comprehensive. So we've in analogy, it's, a, it's actually very manifold. There's multiple components to it, referred to as genomic language processing. This is our AI process that harnesses and normalizes and annotates and presents that data that I just talked about earlier to maximize the sensitivity of, of the results that are, are sought from users who search our platform. 
In addition to the data and the computation, we have a team of 170 folks now with genomic expertise, different flavors of genomic expertise. Many developers have bioinformatic expertise. Our scientists looking at this data, refining models and, and you know, looking at the statistics as well, a small army of genetic curators who review this data on a daily basis, you know, eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, and then some. Those expert curators and variant scientists curate the evidence to interpret those variants to maximize the specificity of these results. So all together through the, the interface um, of the genomic intelligence platform that is Mastermind, this is in the service of accelerating and optimizing diagnostic workflows. And we're used across the world in thousands of diagnostics labs for this kind of routine genetic diagnostic care. So I want to touch on each of those three things a bit to exemplify some of the challenges that attend a database comparison, the complexities of the analysis, and the importance of getting that analysis right. So the first, as I mentioned, is genomic evidence is challenging to aggregate. It's, it was never intended to be aggregated in this way. Uh, it's distributed. You know, you could say geographically, but it's in multiple different places, multiple different resources, multiple different formats, all in the in the um, final culmination of these peer-reviewed published references. So getting those, harnessing them, understanding them, doing that uh, on a regular updated cadence, and doing so with fidelity, with a mind toward the accuracy and, and validity of that information. And that's a challenge, requiring computational solutions. I'm highlighting some aspects of that technical challenge, which is to say, as we well know, genetics is complicated. Writing down the ways that these variants are described in the literature, let alone the way the genes are described, those are complicated. And more than three quarters, this is one example for CFTR, but more than three quarters of the way that these genetic variants are described do not follow a standard nomenclature. So not only is it challenging to aggregate and annotate this data, it's challenging to disambiguate and put that data back together. So um, that information being spread out as it is and being as recondite as it is to understand, it's nevertheless vital. And so that was in the original founding to this day, what Genomenon set out to do. And we had to invent genomic language processing. This is obviously not just an endeavor that I undertook, but this is a shared endeavor by the whole team. It's indexing that data for genes and variants and the associated terms like diseases, phenotypes, and therapies, et cetera, et cetera, and putting all that information together. So that computational approach that I described not only indexes those terms, but ensures that the access to those references is as complete as possible. All, all toward the service of optimizing the sensitivity of the results that are returned. And then lastly, and what I alluded to, our genomic experts interpret the evidence. So I get a lot of questions about, was this reviewed by people? How are people involved? I don't understand. Showing pictures of the team, this is a fraction of our team, just to really underscore the idea that when the data in Mastermind is curated, it has been reviewed by expert curates, curate scientists. There's more than 120 of the 170 or so folks in Genomenon who are dedicated to this task and expert at it and very passionate about the details and getting it right. So those folks optimize specificity for the curated content that's, that's present in Mastermind. And all of that comes together uh, to, to harness and focus our, our mission into this lofty goal of curating the entire human genome. So we're on a mission to systematically curate every variant in each of these genes comprising uh, at first the clinical exome, but ultimately the entire human genome. This means all of those variants for any one of those genes, there's a systematic review of that evidence according to clinical standard framework, uh, the ACMG framework, or uh, the AMP framework by those genomic experts um, who care about and know about the, the rigor that's required when this information is, is put to bear for patient diagnosis. So when you put those three things together in the service of that lofty ambition, genomic evidence, 
genomic language processing, and genomic expertise, there is the possibility that you can optimize both sensitivity and specificity. And I say that because I'm a, a molecular genetic pathologist by training, and so the math that's involved there very much has to do with the trade-offs between sensitivity and specificity. So I'm showing this diagram here um, to illustrate that case for a quantitative test to try to determine whether a patient has or does not have disease. So there's a, a normal distribution of the test results for the cohort of individuals who have the disease and who don't. And where you draw the line a test metric determines the sensitivity and specificity, where if you draw the line over to the left, you optimize for sensitivity and that, that test metric threshold does not miss anybody who does in fact have disease. Whereas if you draw the line to the right, you can optimize for specificity, ensuring that everybody who is above that threshold does have disease. So there's benefits and, and negatives to either of those approaches. and it's very con uh, context dependent. It has to take into account the circumstance and the usefulness of that test, the reason that you're running that test. In, in the middle there, I've, I've drawn a compromise, which is to say, you want a test metric that's gonna be the most util, that's going to minimize how many folks it misses who actually have disease, but maximize the interpretability and the reliability of that test result. So there's a balance when you're talking about quantitative test results and drawing a line and saying, yes, disease, no disease. I talk about being uh, context dependent. Here's a different context. What about when we have categorical designations, not a quantitative distribution, but a yes or no? Uh, and, and I'll show that on a subsequent slide. I like the term um, confusion matrix. I hadn't heard that before uh, I met with some data scientists, but when you have real positives, whatever that means, however that's defined, you can have a test metric or a threshold or a designation have true positives, but also false negatives that you capture or miss in your designation process. And similarly on the other side for true negatives and false positives. So just, just to keep the conversation going, to, to reiterate for most of you, sensitivity means making sure important things aren't missed. And specificity means making sure what is presented is important. So in this context of comparing databases, you need to have a comprehensive data set to start. You need to know what the universe of truth is. And you have to be objective when defining what importance is, what positive or negative means. And in particular for this study, what is relevant? What does that mean? I've got a couple of examples here um, from the corners to the middle, epidemiology studies in the case of RYO, RYO invariance for malignant hyperthermia. Is that an important study? It, I would say it's likely to be, but it depends. Do you have five of those st studies already? Is it a reference citation to other studies and there's no new information here? On the right, in the upper right, there's functional studies. Is this redundant to information that you've already seen? Is the study well powered? is the, it the right functional study. Relevance is relative. On the bottom are the frameworks, the original papers that cite the interpretation framework, which you'll very frequently see cited as a reference in a, a variant interpretation, as though it had been curated when citing the framework that was used. Is that relevant? Yes. Is it relevant to the specific variant and its interpretation? Well, far less so than the top two, again, depending on the content in those studies. And then the middle is a fuzzy case. This is, you know, structure, structural information in a different species, where I, if I'm not mistaken in this study, this paper does not even cite variants, it cites residues in the rabbit RYR1 gene to showcase the, stru the structure of that variant. Is that important? Is that relevant? It depends. There's a, there's a dependence. So um, what I want to emphasize here so that we actually can have an objective measure of relevance, that when you're putting this in practice, um, the relevance is up to the re reviewer, and in particular for patient care in the clinical context of how this information is presented.
whether a reference is relevant or not depends on how much other information you have, what you need, um, and, and as I said, the clinical circumstance dictating what you're trying to do for that patient. So I want to, I think this is the end of the first section here. Mastermind allows you to do both, to have your cake and eat it too, to use a colloquialism. There's curated content that comes from our genomic experts that maximizes specificity, but there's also index content that maximizes the sensitivity and allows the, the actual reviewer, the user of that information to make their own determinations. Having prioritized that information based on likelihood of being important, you can have the benefit of enhanced specificity and enhanced sensitivity without sacrificing one for the other. So with that introduction, let's get to the content of the uh, original publication. So I, I've forgotten the dates at this point now, but sometime earlier this year, this publication came out from a group at the NIH uh, NHGRI who uh, happened to be uh, mastermind users uh, of longstanding, uh, good people. Uh, came, this this re reference came to our attention and um, my interest was immediately drawn to it, uh, especially in some of the figure display items that I, I'll show in a moment here because they didn't comport with my experience of doing similar studies, nor did they comport with our own users experiences, things that they've told us, things that we've co-published, uh, reasons uh, behind why they switched from uh, a competitor to the Mastermind platform. So it certainly piqued our interest when we saw the final results presented. But here's how they came to those results. This is the analytic approach for that publication. It's, it's, they admit here that it's a scoped study. It's for one gene for a, a limited number of variants in that one gene. But for those 50 RYR1 variants, they examined references that were available in Mastermind HGMD, the Human uh, Genetic Mutation Database, uh, both commercial, as well as LitVar and ClinVar, both publicly available. So for the variants, in aggregate, they identified 964 what I call variant reference matches, which is to say there's a paper and it has a variant, that's a variant reference match. So one variant may have multiple variant reference matches and one paper may similarly have multiple variant reference matches, just different variants. So that's an important concept to, to be familiar with as we finish the, the conversation. They reviewed that information. So just like I was talking about, is this valuable? Is it relevant? What is it even saying? They reviewed it um, as primary, as secondary or relevant. So they looked at each of those variant reference pairs and designated a primary variant reference pair as one that presented novel data specific to the variant in question. So novel is subjective, but I think this is a, this is a very good objective framework by which to assess the, the, the content in doing the comparison. So um, th there's no fault there. You have to be objective in order to lead to, to objective results. Secondary means that that reference may only cite a prior work. So there's no original contribution to an understanding of that variant. A, a new patient, a new genotype phenotype correlation, a new functional study, et cetera. But then relevant goes deeper than primary. In order to be relevant, you have to be primary in this case. But relevant here in this uh, author's definition is information in those references for that variant reference pair that is used for the ultimate variant interpretation. And that's subjective, but again, the, you know, they have to make this objective, so I don't think that those are unreasonable criteria, but they're focusing in their analysis on the relevance metric when they're calculating um, sensitivity and specificity, as I'll show here in a moment. So the, the, I hope this isn't too complicated. This is supplemental table one, which comprises the, the it's the heart of the paper because every other display item and analysis stems from this. So I wanted to walk through this so people understood. This is a very long spreadsheet, but each section horizontally is one of those 50 variants. Each row in those individual sections is one of those references uh, identified by PMID. And then each of those columns is some designation about that variant reference pair with comments and there's other annotations, but this is the meat of the matter here. So you'll notice that the first four columns at, to the right of the PMID or the reference are the four databases. 
And then the next three are those designations that I talked about. Is it primary? Is it secondary? Is it relevant? So I mentioned that to be relevant, you have to be primary. There are relevant articles. There are secondary articles that are not relevant. There are primary articles that were not used and therefore for, for ACMG interpretation and therefore in this study not designated as relevant. And then there's references in this study that are fairly inert, that don't cite the variant, never the, nevertheless are included in this um, uh, study, presumably because when a user does a search on a variant in one of those databases, this result is returned. Um, and and I'll, I have a slide that speaks to those types of, of variant reference pairs as well. So sensitivity is in this uh, definition is the number of relevant articles returned by one of those tools divided by the union of all relevant articles from any tool. So that the, the denominator is across all databases, the numerator is specific to that one database for that database's sensitivity metric, um, but they're all revolving around that, that uh, subjectively determined relevance criteria. Again, you have to do that. You have to choose a metric they've chosen relevance here and they've determined it um, manually. Specificity is the number of relevant references per that single database divided by the total number of references returned for that variant query. So this is straightforward, but I wanna use this slide to emphasize that relevance is central to these metrics. This is that image that I was talking about. My eyes, my brain immediately turns to these types of comparison images. This happens to be a four-way Venn diagram, uh, one of my favorite ways to display data. Um, the mastermind is the green oval in the author's hand here, and everything outside of that is what I get interested in is to say, what are those that are not in mastermind? What do I know about them? What can I learn about them? Uh, you know, what are the details? The details in this case matter greatly. So when I saw this paper originally, um, my 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 mind went right to this isn't what I'm used to seeing. So I'm, I'm going to look into the details. This is a summary table of some of those metrics: the primary, secondary, relevant articles. How many of those? different um, types of uh, relevant or total are novel, new, and unique to the, either one of those four databases, the precision or specificity, and the sensitivity. And then I'm just highlighting for ease of reading the, the mastermind, because in my experience, the specificity, when you're looking at curated content, ought to be very high because it's reviewed by those human experts. And the sensitivity ought to be very high because we have genomic language processing. And in my own work, these numbers were about, well, it can't be half of, <laughs> and still be 68%, but they were extremely low compared to my previous experience. And the conclusions that the authors drew from this table was that while Mastermind did have the highest overall um, recall or sensitivity, um, HGMD had the highest precision, but my view of this is it, it there were something so there was something amiss in the original data because this was not my experience. And I'd actually even previously looked at ROYR1 gene itself. So the conclusions that the authors drew from that analytic approach and, and gathering that uh, to produce the results was at the present time, the use of multiple tools is necessary to completely identify literature relevant to curate a variant. And for the foreseeable future, analysts will need to rely on those multiple tools. The problem, as, as you heard me allude to in the beginning, is that there were a great many errors in the data, as I'll walk through briefly. The errors in the data led to errors in the results, led to errors in the conclusion, making the whole publication erroneous. And, and I'm going to walk through our detailed analysis of that data that actually brought this to light. So this was my approach, our approach internally um, to re-examine that data. Supplemental data table one, as I said, was the you know, origin of all of these uh, data points and summary tables and figures. So we looked very closely at supplemental table, uh, data table one. We repeated the entire analysis from you know, start to finish. We don't have uh, license access to HGMD. It's, a, it's not something that was available to us to do the comparison. So that's why it's not part of the 
the review, we were very interested, obviously, in how Mastermind performed and did a very deep dive on the results for Mastermind. But because ClinVar and LitVar are available to us, we also did that for ClinVar and LitVar just to try to figure out where there might have been some issues leading to those the compromises in the data, the results, and the conclusions. So when I say we looked deeply, we didn't just look at the table. We went to each of these references. There were about a thousand total references. We looked at each. We wanted to really understand what was going on, what was the source of the discrepancies, uh, how could we reconcile our experience and the data that we saw with what was presented in the, in the uh, original publication. And then we tallied those changes or those errors very painstakingly. We had the old data set, the original data set, what we found anew, the old metrics, the new, the, the notes about why there was a difference, what we found in those detailed um, uh, analyses of each reference. And then we recalculated sensitivity and specificity as defined by the authors. So th this, these are the types of issues that we saw that became apparent, you know, almost immediately, but we wanted to be sure that we understood the case in total. So uh, bear with me now, I'm going to talk about each of these four um, in, in its own section, but there were variant reference citations for Mastermind that we found that were available at the time of the original study that were missing in the original publication. Further, there were references that had those variants, so variant citation references in Mastermind available at the time the original study was performed that were just not in this original study. So entire references were gone. So not only did Mastermind not, quote, get credit for a reference that, say, was found in ClinVar in the top left, but there were whole references that were available in Mastermind that weren't even in one originally. Similarly, when we looked at these uh, reference uh, sources for, for spe some specific variant reference citations for ClinVar and LitVar, we saw those variant reference citations, but we didn't, we saw them in the uh, supplemental table one, but we didn't see them in ClinVar and LitVar. And then lastly, when we looked closely at these references, there were reference uh, citations for individual variants that we found didn't even contain the variant. It may have contained that position. It may have talked about the gene and other variants. It may have just talked about the gene. It may not have even talked about the gene. But obviously, that's something that you want to take into account when you're tallying up and annotating these data and determining what's relevant or important and what's not. So I want to walk through each of these separately very quickly. But to reorient you to the original data table, again, each chunk horizontally is a variant. Each row is one of those variant reference citations. An X means it was found in one of those databases or it was designated primary, secondary, and or relevant. So the first example is variant reference citations for Mastermind that were omitted. So there's, an, there's no X where there should be an X. And when you're tallying the sensitivity, obviously this is going to compromise the veracity of those results. So when we looked, there were in fact references as defined by this table for that variant in Mastermind that were just not in this table. There were 182 such references out of a total of 964. So not a small change. And the, the result of this when corrected would be that there would be a great increase in mastermind sensitivity. So in the original study, mastermind sensitivity was erroneously lowered because of this systematic issue. So similarly, there were variant reference citations that were listed as an X for, for ClinVar and or LitVar that were in fact not found in those references when we when we looked. And we we had to the time and look at you know, the previous instantiation of ClinVar and we looked and looked and looked and there was a, a, a number of those references that were just not present at all at any time in ClinVar or LitVar. That was 61. And of those 61, about 20, 21 were actually designated as primary in you know, one of the different databases, in this case, presumably HGMD. Uh, so sorry, presumably in this case for either ClinVar or LitVar, but they just weren't present in those databases. Uh, the, the result of that is that ClinVar and LitVar sensitivity were erroneously elevated in the original study. So the first error, um, erroneously deprecated mastermind uh, analysis. And in this case, um, the sensitivity for ClinVar and LitVar were erroneously elevated. 
Another situation that I alluded to before is there were references that were found in Mastermind and Mastermind only that were not included in this data set. They were not included in original supplemental table one. So I've added them here. They are real and they, they deserve an X in Mastermind because they were found in that database. Again, a reflection of the maximal sensitivity that genomic language processing and computational organization and annotation of this evidence affords. So there were 321 such references citing any one of those 50 RYRN variants that were just not in the table at all. And um, of those, there were a, a significant fraction that were also designated as primary. So presumably important for you know, downstream variant curation and clinical workflows. So the consequence of this error, again, is that the sensitivity of mastermind, given that these references are in mastermind and were omitted, was erroneously lowered. And the last uh, error issue was that um, when we examined these references, there were references that were included that didn't mention the variant at all. And there were a, a number of them. There were 92 of those, 82 of which came from ClinVar, many of which were citing those frameworks that I talked about, well, many of which were you know, citing that structural study that I, that I mentioned uh, earlier that doesn't contain the specific variants, uh, may not even be the, the same species of gene. So they're included because the submitter to ClinVar deemed them important, deemed them relevant in some way, but they weren't present uh, the variant was not present in those references, which is the way that Mastermind articulates its first pass uh, search results. Um, although those are the first pass Mastermind search results, that reference, those other variants, those are all found if you do the search appropriately by asking the correct questions. So the result of this error amounting to 92 of those variant reference pairs was that Mastermind sensitivity was erroneously lowered because um, they were in Mastermind, but they were not retrieved by the authors who had only done the, the first pass search, whereas if they had done an appropriate search of Mastermind, they would have seen those uh, results if they had an RYR1 variant or if they mentioned the RYR1 gene as predicated on a Mastermind user search. So um, I don't want to go through uh, any of the details about the correspondence, other than to say that the authors were were actually very gracious, and we had a great you know exchange of, of ideas and communication. And the the content of the paper was corrected. Uh, they there were issues. They they were readily um, uh, identified when we separately did our our separate revisitation of these studies, and the authors have corrected uh, their work. I want to now turn our attention to wrapping this up, talking about it a little bit more, and, and ending with a conclusion before we go into any Q&A, um, if, if anyone in the audience has any questions. Um, their, their correction, I want to say, was not in fact a correction of the original data, which is what my team and I did. We mistakenly went through and looked back in time at the information that was available at the time of the original study and did the cross-referencing and did the pairwise, this is the original, this is the corrected, this is the reason, bookkeeping. The author correction, if, you, if you're interested to go see that correction, is a new study. It's similarly structured, but they looked anew. They gathered the you know, search results from each of those databases anew. And it, since the original study had been performed so many years ago, obviously there had been changes. I'm going to talk about some of those changes, but the authors made a decision to redo the analysis with different data. And uh, I, I, I'm not saying that's a good or bad decision, but I definitely want to point that out to the audience here to note that this is not, in fact, a correction as much as it is a new but similar study. Here are those results. I, I mentioned um, that there were a number of mastermind references that were missed. In this case, there's about 500 all told that were missed as you go from blue bar to blue bar over the, the left, the total number of articles. There were many, 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 almost half of the articles that mastermind has that were missed in the original. And then I, I won't linger on the details here of primary, secondary, and relevant, but if you get to the right, you'll see the precision or specificity in the sensitivity studies for the previous study, the original publication, and the corrected 
as I said, new analysis, similar analysis, but new analysis on the bottom. So if you look at the specificity of precision results and the sensitivity results, you can see that mastermind sensitivity did increase in the author's hand by their definition, which again involves that subjective criteria of relevance. When you do the calculation differently, what I think is more broad based, these numbers increase more, but defined by relevance in the author's hand, using the author's own data, masterminds sensitivity went up dramatically. Uh, I definitely wanna point out the precision and how that precision for mastermind didn't change. And why I, I, I think it's important to say that the authors embarked on a new study, not a correction of the previous study, but a new study. Because I've mentioned many times now, uh, genomenon comprises a number, more than 100 of genomic experts who are reviewing this information. That information is being presented in Mastermind as curated content, very much like the content in the HDMD database, curated content. The genomenon curated content was not used for this study, despite being available when a user performs that search. So the comparison uh, for precision between indexed content, which is what the authors focused on for this for Mastermind, and curated content for HDMD is not um, equitable. There's no parity there. And the content that's curated for, mas uh, for Mastermind for RYR1 available at the time this corrected study was, was performed. Um, so two things in, in corollary that I wanna point out is one, the authors didn't highlight something that I think is really important when you're thinking about sensitivity, and in particular, the end effect of the sensitivity of a database. And that is here, if you look at the variant level, not at the individual variant reference level, which is per paper, did this tool or that tool retrieve all of the references, which you saw Mastermind was superior to those other databases. The question now is, for any one of those variants, did this tool, this database, return any meaningful information? And the, again, this is comporting with my experience. For the 50 variants, every one of those 50 variants, Mastermind returned results of various stripes, primary, relevant, what have you. So Mastermind being maximally sensitive ensures that you have the highest chance, likelihood of finding references for any of these variants you know, in, in accordance with how um, they're circumstantially important to the clinical uh, circumstance. So at the variant level, the mastermind sensitivity is 100%. For every one of those 50 variants, a result was returned, giving the, the reviewer in the clinic, presumably seeing a patient, something to go by. In contrast, for both ClinVar and uh, HGMD, pardon me, for ClinVar and HGMD, there were two variants, they were different variants, but out of the 50, there were two variants for which there were no references in either of those databases. So if you look at the variant level, there's a benefit to having a maximally sensitive database because in those two cases, for ClinVar and for HGMD, those variants would return no results. And two out of 50 is 4%. And if you think as a, as a clinical diagnostician about your work, you're going to encounter some of those 4% variants that don't have references, that don't have any meaningful information by which to make your diagnostic interpretation. So I wanted to point that out to say, that is the benefit of a maximally sensitive database. It is not to consternate, it's not to overwhelm with evidence, but it is to say to be sure that in the context of a clinical case and what the user, the searcher, the reviewer is looking for, that information would be available to them. So I wanted to point that out definitely, but I also wanted to make the point that I was alluding to earlier, that there is curated content for, uh, for um, RYR1 in Mastermind. There's curated content for hundreds of genes comprising the clinical exome in Mastermind. That's a readily available to users and that has a more equitable um, uh, comparison to the other uh, database, HGMD, which also is curated. So a more uh, um, appropriate comparison would be to have looked at that curated content. Those genomic experts that I talked about, 
they follow the ACMG guidelines, which, if you'll recall, was the criteria by which the original authors determined whether it was relevant. The curated content cites those references that are reviewed and understood and adjudicated by our genomic experts so that the mastermind specificity, according to the author's definition of relevance, is 100%. Each one of the references that are presented for a curated variant in Mastermind meets those criteria. And I'm pointing out with this Sankey plot that when you look at those interpretations, there's very large agreement with what the authors determine in their own curated um, uh, evidence and variant interpretation with what our curators found. There's discrepancies, there's differences, there always will be. One of the, the reasons that we have Mastermind structured as, as we do is to show our evidence, to show our work, to show which references led up to which evidence designations, which led up ultimately to a given variance uh, overall interpretation. So a reviewer, a clinical diagnostician, somebody looking at this information can trace it back and pass their own judgment in the context of that clinical page, patient, that clinical case. In this case, a likely path or a VUS the actionability of those may be predicated on the, the circumstances of that clinical case, which, as I said, again, is why Mastermind seeks to present that information. The curated content for enhanced specificity and ease of use, but the, the sensitive information, the index content, annotated and prioritized and presented so that you can go deeper if you want to, if the case warrants it. So I, I want to bring that all together to remind you of those three component parts of the Mastermind Genomic Intelligence Platform. It is the underlying evidence, as I said, the vital peer-reviewed scientific clinical in publications and supplemental data sets. It's the ability to index that very broadly, very sensitively, but then bringing that to the attention of our genomic experts who can review it according to clinical standard uh, processes with the same rigor that our own mastermind users apply when they're you know, identifying uh, which variant to, to put on their clinical diagnostic report. So all three of those components, it's the, you know, three legs of a sturdy stool, come together to optimize both sensitivity and specificity in a way that's not possible with one of those quantitative disease diagnosing uh, lab tests that I talked about earlier. This in fact is different, you can have specificity and sensitivity in, in an appropriate way. So um, I want to wrap up before we get to any questions that anyone has on their minds by saying Genomenon is really its people. We're a team of scientists and genetics professionals all passionate about patients. It's, it's in our DNA, if you'll, if you'll permit me. And they all know what it means to get things right. They know what it means to a patient, but they know what is required of the data and the complexities and the nuances. They do this every day. So they're, they're extremely motivated by those details, by getting it right, by saving the receipts and ensuring that they're looking at the evidence um, with that crit critical eye. And the reason we're doing it is for patients. Uh, this, is, this is an example of one of those patients where, where the the diagnostician, the, the person looking at this evidence through the lens of, of mastermind, what has been presented to them to help diagnose that patient, I can say with certainty that without the findings obtained from Genomenon, I would not have been able to provide a diagnosis for this patient. So that's what it's all about for Genomenon. That is why we maximize sensitivity. That is why we review that evidence with that criticality that, that I talked about. That is why we're all motivated to do, continue to do this work, it's in the service of, of patients like, like um, are, is shown here. So some takeaways regarding the original study, the analytic approach failed to ap fully appreciate, they mention it, but they, I, in my regard, they failed to fully appreciate the distinction between indexed and curated data and the reasons behind either. Uh, and as I mentioned, was not a patient focused, but rather was reference focused. A patient focused view would be for this patient, these variants, which databases were sufficient and efficacious at coming to a diagnosis. As I talked about, 
at the variant level, Mastermind found 50 out of 50 of those ROI on variants with meaningful references. But more to the point, the results of the original study were deeply flawed. And therefore, the conclusions of the original study were flawed as well. Uh, kudos to the author recognized this. They corrected the, the record as, as we're talking about here. Um, but the conclusions weren't altered. As I, as I walk through why, why uh, th that, that is a bit of a challenge for me, especially because the curated content in Mastermind was not regarded, was not included, which would have made for a much more equitable comparison, especially to um, the other commercial database. And lastly, the benefits of a maximally sensitive database weren't noted, just as I highlighted with the with the patient vignette. That's the importance of a maximally sensitive database, is making sure that the user has every opportunity to find a meaningful reference for any one of these patients. So the last takeaways I'll leave you with here is Mastermind is demonstrably the most sensitive genomic variant database in our hands and the author's hands. In my view, given the curated content uh, that we're curating systematically, you know, for hundreds of genes comprising a clinical exome, Mastermind is also the most specific variant database. You have to be looked, you have to know how to find it. It's very straightforward, but you have to seek it out. Mastermind is indexed data, it's maximally sensitive data, but it's also curated data, maximally specific data. And then finally, given these two things, Mastermind can, in fact, be used as a standalone tool if the goal is to see everything that you that could be important and to review that information quickly um, as it's been organized by, by experts according to a clinical framework. So with that, um, I'll, I'm gonna, as I'm the sole presenter, I'm going to assess whether there are any questions here that I can address in the, in the waning minutes of, of the webinar. As I turn my attention there, I, I want to thank you for your attention. Uh, I want to invite you to create a mastermind account following that bit.ly link if you haven't, but also contact us. If you'd like to talk to me specifically, um, I'm happy to take an email separately, or you can reach out to hello at, and we can talk together um, through one of our other genomic experts as well. So let me turn my attention to um, any questions that have appeared here. Um, so here's a, a question that I can tackle is, what errors do you see being made most frequently in papers that have been retracted or corrected? So that's a, a it's a good question. I, it allows me to say that a correction, let alone a retraction, those are very rare events. So there's a very, very, very small sample size. Um, so if I broaden the question uh, and reflect on genomic language processing, I can say, what are more common typographical issues that don't warrant a full correction, but that nevertheless you encounter on a day-to-day -day basis as a variant analyst, as a clinical diagnostician, or as a data scientist, you know, run, running the GLP behind the scenes at Genomenon. Um, HGBS nomenclature, which is the standard way that we pattern variant uh, descriptions, is challenging. There's a lot of ways to get it wrong. Those are the errors that I most commonly see, which is, again, why we cast such a wide net and seek to be maximally sensitive, because some of them require disambiguation. Some of them require very careful attention to detail about how the authors are applying different transcripts, say, and how that influences how those variants are described. So that is, I would say, by far the most common challenge that we see. Um, when it comes to that broader question of a systematic, you know, uh, a pattern in the variant, uh, the references that are corrected or, or retracted, I would say that that's more of a rarity. It's much more likely that you see individual variant nomenclature errors that need to be addressed, again, in the context of, say, a, a evidence curation for variant interpretation. So here's a here's another question. Um, do you think that there needs to be more stringent review of any paper before it is published in a journal? So it's a fantastic question. Uh, there's a lot to say about the scientific review process, the scientific publication process, but I don't want to editorialize. I will say that um, reviewing this information is hard, right? It's hard to put this information together. It's, it's hard to do that work. And when you're reviewing 
these references before they're published, you can't be expected to look at every detail. You can't be expected to redo the analysis. We obviously knew well what Mastermind was able to do. And so the, the discrepancy in our expectation and what was presented was pretty obvious to us. But I'm not surprised, especially if the review went to a user who was not familiar with Mastermind, that these issues weren't caught in the review process. But the review process isn't a point in time. It's actually a process. And science as we have been uh, uh, counseled in our training and, and in, the, in the present, is self-correcting. Benefit to publishing. There's a reason for it. It gets out there. And there is the ability for scientists, very much like the authors, and I to intercommunicate. And I, I have to say that I view this as a bit of a triumph of science being self-correcting. There, there's no animus here. There's no ill will or anything like that. There's no blame to assign because the scientific process has worked. There is a correction of the record. I'm, I'm going through and, and giving some commentary and some background color, but the reference has been corrected. There's dis disagreements of, in the interpretation of some of those results that I articulated on this call, but I think fundamentally um, the review process and the fact that science is self-correcting has worked out here. Um, let me see, maybe time for, uh, for one more question. Um, yeah, okay, this is a good question. The paper said that none of the platforms were sufficient on their own to handle verification, which, which I disagree with. So the question is, do you think there is value in using more than one platform to gain a second opinion? So, um, I happen to know that many mastermind users, especially in, in the past, have used multiple tools, uh, ClinVar, HGMD, in conjunction with mastermind, it, you know, two, four years ago, before we had a curation team apparatus and embarked on our mission to curate the entire genome, we just had index data. So it did make a ton of sense to use HGMD first, which has curated data. Go to, go to one of the curated databases, and if it's there and you trust the result or you have that in your SOP, then you could go forth. But if it wasn't there, if you wanted, as is you know, dictated by your job, to look in the details and scrutinize those details and not take anybody's word for it, you wanted to look at the details, you could go to Mastermind, and users did. Now that Mastermind has embarked on curating the entire genome for, for genes for which there's curated content, there's less and less of a reason to go to those other curated sources as a first pass tool. Because Mastermind has the benefit of maximal sensitivity, but now for those curated genes has the benefit of maximal specificity as well. And so there's less and less of a reason to need to spread your, your, your interests across multiple databases. So that's a deeper conversation that I'm happy to have with, with anybody who'd like to, to have chat one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I'd also like to say that the ClinVar data is in Mastermind. It's freely available. It was you know, paid for uh, through tax dollars and you know, um, U.S. citizen sponsorship. That information is available in Mastermind, and Mastermind makes it easy to search that information using genomic language processing for your search results to see those uh, references and those variants whether they're the self-same variant, a related variant, or a variant in a nearby region. So my conclusion stands based on what I've assessed here is that I do believe that Mastermind uh, is a standalone tool, maximizing sensitivity, maximizing specificity and workflow efficiency, et cetera. Um, so uh, there's, there's several more questions here. Uh, I don't have time to answer them all, but I do wanna make sure that I answer them. So they're noted as well as the submitter being noted. So anybody who did ask a question, I'm, I'm happy to um, uh, email you afterwards. With that, uh, I will conclude, but before I do, I'd like to commend you to please fill out the poll that will appear. I'll leave the webinar live here for a few minutes. Please do fill this out. So just like Genomenon cares about the data from the literature used in clinical diagnostics, we care about this data too. Um, our whole company is motivated uh, to serve our customers, to serve the patients who those customers serve. We want to get better. So I'd love to hear from you about how valuable you thought this discussion.
if you have any feedback or input for me or any suggestions for um, other content for this kind of webinar series. So I'll leave the webinar up. Uh, I will turn my camera off and allow you to fill out that, that survey to give us that valuable information. And I'll, I'll conclude by thanking you again for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you all.